The heart is a fascinating, fascinating organ in the human body. Essentially, its purpose is to pump blood through blood vessels, and it carries, that blood carries oxygen and nutrients throughout the circulatory system. I sound really smart, but thank you, Google. You got these heart valves. Blood flows through your heart one direction. Preventing from backflow because, because of these heart valves. All while your heartbeat dum, 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 has this rhythm because you guys didn't know it, but you like to rock. Down inside of you, there is a rock band of rhythm making cells that gives you a heartbeat. It's insane. When you think about the complexity, the beauty, the intelligent design behind the human heart. Some hearts are sick. Some people have what we call cardiovascular disease. There's numerous different types of cardiovascular diseases, and it's actually the number one death, number one killer in America, heart disease. Heart disease is causing us to drop like flies. Why? The contributing factors are uh, not exercising, being overweight, smoking, eating foods that are harmful to our health. There's all these contributing factors that are causing and creating heart disease. Nonetheless, in some situations, it's hereditary, but, but heart disease is wiping people out. Some people have problems with their heart. And there's tests that the doctor can give right? And most common of all is probably an EKG. And, and basically, the, the EKG is testing the, uh, the electrical patterns in, in your skin. It's, it's, it's sensing the, the electrodes in your skin, and it detects whether there's something wrong with your heart. It reveals, it exposes abnormalities or maybe even some heart disease that's there. And then when that happens, your doctor sits down with you and your doctor begins to tell you the results of the test that was taken on your heart and begins to lay it out. And in that instance, I would say most people, when they're given the news that there is an abnormality, there's a, there's a, a concern with their heart, they usually pay attention. Why? Why would somebody pay attention to their doctor in that moment if the doctor said you have a problem with your heart? Well, the obvious answer is, I think we all would say, if, if I have a problem with my heart, a medical problem, and I pay no attention to it whatsoever, eventually, if left just completely untouched, if I don't deal with it, if I don't address it, I could probably die, flatline, right? And I would dare say if, if, if one of you was told by your doctor today that there is a potential risk for heart disease, if there's a concern, if there's a problem with your heart, you would probably be on the edge of that hospital bed and you would probably be asking your doctor, what do I need to do differently to be able to prevent or bring healing, to bring correction to this process, this, this, this path that I'm about to head down. What can I do, doctor? And you would probably be all ears as to whatever your doctor would tell you you need to do from this point forward. But if today, during this new series, Heart Monitor, if by chance something is said in this message that causes God, the great physician, the great heart doctor of all time, to speak to your heart. And you hear him say something that, that deals with your heart, and he helps you to recognize and realize that you have a heart problem. Would you be on the edge of your seat? 
Would you be like, God, as soon as this service is over, I am, I'm going to go all out. I'm going to do whatever it is you tell me I need to do. I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to think differently. I'm going to act differently. I'm going to talk differently. God, whatever you tell me I need to do, I am willing to do whatever I need to do because I have a spiritual heart problem. The reality is, Week in and week out, if you listen to messages, if you listen to God's word, if you're in church or maybe you just hear something on the radio or maybe a friend says something at work or maybe you read something that's on the fridge in the break room and it just speaks to you and you hear the voice of God so subtly and so quietly say, hey, there's a problem with your heart. So many times we just let it go. It's not an emergency. It, it, it's not a do or die situation. You're thinking, man, you know, I'll, I'll get to that, God. I, I really, hey, 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 God, I know. I know what you're going to say. I, I know what you're going to say. We'll deal with that later. Let's do that later, God. But if your doctor, physical doctor, said you were going to die, there'd all of a sudden be an emergency. But why do we take the most important things, the things that are eternal versus the things that are in the physical and temporal? Why do we consider those things that are physical such a higher priority than the things that are spiritual, which dictate and determine our eternity? Why? Why? The question for you today, is it possible that each and every one of us in this room may have something of concern in our heart? And are we willing to hear what God has to say about it? And furthermore, are we willing to spare no expense to do what we need to do to deal with that concern? If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to look at verse 9 as we launch into this new series, Heart Monitor. We're going to test the condition of our heart. It says this, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things, desperately wicked, who really knows how bad it is? I want you to see that part that's highlighted in blue. Who really knows how bad it is? As Brad said, if we had a physical issue with our heart, we would go to a cardiologist. We would go to our family doctor and then maybe be referred off. And I want to tell you a little story about myself. I'm not one who loves to run to the doctor. I had to when I had children. So the last time I had seen a doctor was when I delivered my twins 13 years ago. And about a year and a half ago, Brad and I decided maybe it would just be a good idea to, like, go get a checkup. Like, I don't really know why we want to do that other than, like, we need to be preventative, right? If there's something there, I guess we should know about it. And so we go in, and we're like, we don't even know what you do. Just go ahead and do it. Like, run some blood tests. Do whatever you need to do to tell us we're healthy so we can go on feeling good, you know, with our life. And as, as the doctor was asking me questions... She determined that um, because I had been having, one of my arms was going numb quite often, which isn't that normal for everybody. (laughs) If you raise four kids, doesn't something go numb from time to time? Your arm, your, you know, you get blurry, whatever, you know? And then I was like, I do sometimes have some pain in my chest. She's like, we probably should check this out. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm good, you know? And so she does the family history and my grandfather died of a massive heart attack at 38, and I just happened to be 38 when I was there. And so she's like, you know, I really think we probably should run an EKG. I'm like, really? What's that going to cost? <laughs> now, do we not all do this, right? I had symptoms that something probably isn't going quite right with my heart, even though I try to take care of myself. And yet, my first thought is, I don't know that I want to have that done. I don't want to pay for that. And more than not wanting to pay for that, I don't want to hear what you have to say after that test. And the reality is, everybody in every industry and every line of work, they have a suggestive sell. They have something that they They want to upsell you. They want to upsell you to the next thing, the next program, the next whatever. Listen, when when you're eating dinner, (laughs) okay, at your favorite restaurant, and they say, "Would I? Can I get you an appetizer?" get you maybe some smoked brisket, you pulled pork, whatever, nachos with some jalapenos on it, and it's going to be like five or six, eight bucks. And You're like, like, I'm yes. like, yes, we will do that. Wasn't thinking about it, but now that you mentioned that sounds really yummy. I'm thinking, okay, suggestive cell, good job. But when your doctor suggestive sells an EKG, 
it's a little bit different. It is different. And so I sat there and I was like, and Brad wasn't in the room. You like to bounce things off <laughs> of people. But I was like, he was in another room. And I'm like, uh, I, you know, my goodness, I'm here. I might as well do it before I have a heart attack. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, okay, go ahead and run the test. And I'm sitting there as she's putting all these gluey electro things, whatever they are, these leads all over me. And I'm laying there, you know, half dressed thinking this is uncomfortable. But, you know, it really wasn't the test itself that I was afraid of. It really wasn't having the gooey on me and and having to lay there on this cold table. It was really the fear of the unknown. It was really what she might come back and tell me. It was really wondering, would my life have to change? Is something going to have to be different? Is she about to tell me that I have a problem, that I have some type of heart disease, something that's going to change and alter my future? And so for all of us, and I guess I'll tell you, I didn't tell the first crowd. There was nothing wrong with me. (laughs) I really do think it was just stress for my four children. But I should have told the first crowd. Hopefully they catch that. There was nothing wrong with my heart. And so I left feeling a little bit better because I was like, whoo, there's nothing wrong. I'm doing good. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. But, you know, it's really the fear of the unknown. And what we're talking about in this series, Heart Monitor, is willingly laying ourselves before God and saying, God, what's the condition of my heart? Willingly saying, God, if there's something that's not right, I'm willing to realign my life. The Bible talks about one of the names of God being that he is Jehovah Rapha. And you say, what in the world is that? It's Hebrew, and Jehovah Rapha simply means God, my healer. And it comes from Exodus chapter 15. You can see it here at the end of this verse. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but at the end it says, For I am the Lord who heals you. And he was explaining to the Israelites who he was. He was coming to them and saying, This is who I am. I am the great physician. So when it comes to a spiritual heart test or a spiritual heart monitor, the only one in the world who can really give you a spiritual EKG is God himself. You see, even for ourselves, we tend to brush off symptoms. Physically, we do it just like I was doing. I was like, I'm fine. I do not want to test. But we also do it spiritually. You see, we know what we take in on a daily basis. When it comes to the food we eat physically, I know when I'm eating something I shouldn't be. I know when I'm not exercising like I should be. I know when I'm not taking care of myself the way I should. And spiritually, we know it as well. We know whether or not we're taking in the word of God on a daily basis. And we know the real condition of our heart. But here's the thing. We like to deceive ourselves. We like to think we're doing better than we really are. And what we want you to understand through this is that, you know what? God is looking for people who desperately want to please him with their life. He's looking for people who are saying, I'm all in. I'll stand up. I'll surrender. I'll do anything you ask me to do. And you may be asking yourself today, but why? I mean, really, tell me why. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, and you're asking, why would I want to please God? Because that would entail changing my life. That's, that's really what it is. When you say yes to Jesus, it gets into your personal life. It gets into the way that I do what I do every single day. And you say, tell me why. Well, let me tell you why. Go to the book of Deuteronomy, or it'll be on the screen for you. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. <clears throat> I love this passage, and I've quoted this to my children, and I quote it often to myself because I just love it. This is what it says. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to start in verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and you keep all his commandments that I'm giving you today. Now listen, if you're going to obey and you're fully keeping all the commandments, then what are you doing? You're living to please God, all right? God was speaking to the children of Israel, but it applies to us today. And he goes on, he says this, The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings. Highlight that word or circle it in your Bible. If that's conditional. You obey the Lord your God. Now listen to this. This is what I love. And some versions read it different than others, but this is what this version says. And it says in verse 3, you're going to be blessed in your towns and your fields. They'll be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offsprings of your herds and your flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets, your bread boards will be blessed. Whatever you do, wherever you go, you will be blessed. One version that I've read and I love so much says, Bless going in, bless going out. Blessings on my kids, blessings on my careers. You will be 
blessed. Now listen, the word blessed, if you've never done a study on this word, what it means is this. It means happy, prosperous, and successful. Now, regardless of whether you've ever invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life, regardless of whether or not you have a relationship with him, what do we want in this life? Seriously, boil it all down. We want to be happy. Who wants to live stressed out every day of your life? We want to be happy. We want to be prosperous. What is prosperous? Oh, I don't want to be rich. I didn't say that. Being prosperous is having everything that you need. All right? It's, it's, we think to ourselves, if I could just make a little bit more money, I would be happy. Right? And then for most of us, we want to be successful. We want to feel like we do something in this world to make a difference. We want to feel like that when we get up and we go to work and we come home, that we're, we're not just living and breathing, but we're making a difference. We want to be successful. Well, listen, God laid it out black and white. This, there's no gray in this whole chapter, and I love it because sometimes we don't get it. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes it's kind of above our head. We don't really get it. This is so clear. It's like, hey, if you want to be blessed, you want to be happy, prosperous, and successful, then live to please God. Because here's the thing. God created us. God purposed your life. He's the one that knows exactly what you were created and destined to do. But the opposite, if we don't choose to do that, and we have free will, but if we don't choose to do that, then what happens, Brad? So it's like if you have kids, all you really want them to do is obey. Why? Because you know what life is full of all these challenges and all these trials and struggles. Life is hard. And you've been down that road and you're trying to keep your children from harm. You're trying to set them up so that they can experience life to its fullest and be all who God has called them to be. But you just want them during that process, you want them to be obedient. And when they're not obedient, what do you do? You're like, hey, I'm going to make your life a living hell. That's what's going to happen right now because you're not listening to me and I need to shake you up a little bit. I need to, I need to heat it up a little on the hind end so we clean out the wax and make it melt in your ear so you can listen to what I'm saying. I love you, but you are going down the wrong path. God has made it so simple. He loves us so much, but he just wants us to want to please him. And when we have veered off the path that he has planned for us, you know what I'm talking about. You can work your fingers to the bone because it's just never enough. The house isn't just big enough. The car isn't nice enough. I don't have enough land. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to go here. I want to go there. It's never enough. It's never enough. Completely, continually dissatisfied. Never content. Never happy. God says, listen, I, uh, I need you to pay attention to me. Because if you don't pay attention to me, if you don't live a life of obedience, if you f- refuse to listen to me, and you don't obey the commands and the decrees I'm giving you today, all these, listen, strong word, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. This is not one of those messages that I'm going to boost on social media and pay hundreds of dollars so that people will listen to how they can be cursed, because it's not a popular message, but it is the truth. The fact is God loves you enough to make you uncomfortable enough to get your attention to get you back on track because so many of us have heart conditions. Here's what's going to happen when we're off track. Verse 16 says, your towns and your fields will be cursed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be cursed. It almost sounds like the most negative infomercial you've ever heard. It's like, why would I want to buy that? Your children and your crops, they'll be cursed. The offspring of your herds and flocks, they'll be cursed too. And if that's not all, right here, wherever you go, whatever you do, it'll all be cursed. That's an awesome message, right? No, that's a horrible message. I don't want to be cursed. You don't want to be cursed. But God has to get our attention because he wants so bad for you and I to want to please him. I've talked to people over and over and over, and they're just not happy. What's the answer, Pastor Brad? Well, I don't have all the answers, but I'm holding on to the one who does. And here's the answer. You got to be in sync with your Savior. You've got to be in right positioning with God. You have to want to please and obey your master in heaven who loves you. Not only does he love you, but he gave himself for you. 
that you wouldn't die eternally or spiritually, but you would live an everlasting, abundant life. Get in sync with your Savior. He loves us that much that he's willing to get our attention, and we should be thankful for that. You know, it's really easy when you hear this message to say, okay, so if I please God, my heart is right, then everything's going to go right in my life. Nothing will ever go wrong. I didn't say that. The word blessing said happy, prosperous, and successful. It didn't say without ever having troubles. You see, we live in a world where we're going to have trouble. We're going to live in a world where there's going to be times that the doctor is going to say things are wrong. And we have to check ourselves to say, God, it's easy to please you when everything is going right. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, if you're trying to live for God, if you're one of those people who have said yes to Jesus and you're trying, when everything's going good, it's easy to be thankful. It's easy to feel blessed. It's easy to be like, God, I love you so much, man. Everything's going right. I got that bonus at work. I got the, you know, I got the promotion. My kids are being so good. They've been at grandma's for a week, you know? And then, and it's like, yes, everything is just going right. But what about when everything doesn't go so right? You see, Brad and I, we constantly say, and we have since our kids were born and probably before, but we say this all the time. How are you doing? We're blessed. We're blessed. We're not rich. We're blessed. We feel blessed every day of our life. Does that mean we don't have problems? No, it doesn't. You know, in the last year and a half of our life, Brad and I have been very focused on paying off the rest of our debt. We're so close. We, don't, we want to live debt-free. We're so close, and we're trying so hard. And about a year and a half, everything started breaking. I mean, everything started breaking. The fuel pump went out of the car. Actually, let me back up. We paid off the van. We have a sweet sweet ride. You're all jealous. I know. We paid it off and we were like, yes, no more car payment. The next one we're going to save up and buy in cash. All right. And so we're, we're crazy. We listen to Dave Ramsey and Chris Brown and we're all about living debt free. So we don't have that bondage. And so we paid it off and it wasn't like a month later, the fuel pump goes out of the car, left us stranded in Tahlequah at a ball game. And thank God we had two of our families from the church at that game. And we're like, we just paid it off. Let's tow it home. You know what I'm saying? Like, thank you, Lord. And so like the whole time we're telling ourselves, like I'm preaching to myself right in that moment. Don't complain. Do not complain. You are still blessed. So what if your car is broken down? Your family's fine. We could have been stranded on the side of the road, but we're not. We're in a parking lot and Clayton Main is here with us. It's awesome. Brandon's across town. He's on his way. We're going to be fine. We get the fuel pump taken care of. We're like, whoo, thank you, Jesus. About a month goes by transmission goes out. Yes, it did. It totally went out. But again, it didn't leave us stranded. So they tow our beautiful silver minivan. We just couldn't go anywhere. (laughs) We couldn't go anywhere. And so we tow it in and we put a new transmission in it, like $2,400. Like, woo. All right, God, what in the world are you doing? All of that could have went to our other debt. And then things just crazy over and over. The well decides one day we go to turn the water faucet on. Nothing comes out. One of my kids call. Hey, mom, like I turned the faucet on. Nothing's coming out. I'm like, that sounds like a problem. I'm like, I'll be home later. You know what I mean? It's like, eh, it'll be fine, right? No, it wasn't fine. $2,400 to go to fix the well, only to find out that now the well has gas in it. New pump, all of a sudden you're thinking everything should be running smooth. And every time you go to take a shower, there's gas in your lines. If you've never had it, it's wonderful. It's fun. You should try it. It's exciting. So much fun. It it's exciting. So much, so much it's fun. a daily yes. test, right? You get in the shower, it's like, you like a just want to wash my hair. Her, her head in the shower is like, <laughs> and then Got you this. go to like wash your hands in the sink and you turn it on. You kind of jump back to see because it's about to explode on you. And I'm not kidding. Like, Shotgun every day system. we'd be like, don't complain. Don't complain. We're going to get this fixed. And so we literally just had that done last week, another two grand to fix that. Listen to me. What I'm trying to tell you is, are we still blessed? Yes, we are blessed. We are blessed and highly favored. Having problems doesn't mean you're not blessed. All right. Living in alignment with God doesn't mean that you're not going to have issues in your life, that things aren't going to break down, that people aren't going to get sick, that things aren't going to happen. It means you're going to be in the right position to handle it when it does. You see, our perspective on God didn't change because junk went wrong in our life. You see, we sat in the chair and said, God, we believe that you're in total control. 
We wanted to pay off our debt and add on to our home. But if that's not your plan for us right now and you've got something different, then we're going to keep on trucking and we're going to shut our mouth and we're going to be blessed. We're going to be thankful for where you have us. See, it's all about a heart condition. And that's what we're talking about this whole entire month. I want you to go with me, if you will, to Psalms 139. This is where we're going to land this month. David wrote this psalm, King David. And King David, in the book of Acts, it tells us that he was a man after God's own heart. I've always loved that because it's like, what, what do I have to be to be a woman or to be a man after God's own heart? To long to please God. The reason that David was called that is because he literally wanted to do anything and everything that God would ask him to do without question. David was a man who ran for his life. He was a man who had enemies and he even had so much dysfunction in his own family that one of his own sons tried to overthrow the kingdom and take his throne and his son died. I mean, this guy had problems, but yet he was a man after God's own heart. And when he pins Psalms 139, he starts off, and I, I, I don't have it on the screen. Don't stress out upstairs. I want to read just one little part to you in the beginning. It says this, O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. And he goes on and he says, you know when I get up, you know when I lay down. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it. And he goes all through this in the, in the beginning of Psalms 139, and basically what he's saying is, God, you know everything. And then he goes on to say, you knit me together in my mother's womb, and you had a purpose for my life. And he begins to explain through the beginning of this psalm, God, you know everything, you're all present, and you're all powerful. And then we come to the very end of this chapter, and this is where we're going to land today, and it says this, because, listen to me, because God created you, because God already knows everything about you and about me, because God is everywhere present, he sees everything that we do. He knows what we're going to say before we say it. He knows exactly what our days hold. David said this. He said, search me. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. There's three phrases in here that we want you to circle or highlight. Write them down if you're taking notes. And it's this. He says, search me. What does it mean to search someone? To search someone is to examine them, to investigate, to get things out of the way and really see what's really there. Have you ever spring cleaned your house? I hope you have. But, you know, sometimes we let things go a little too long. And then when you move furniture and you go to vacuum or you, like, you can't find the remote control and so you move a couch cushion, you're like, oh, my God. Goodness, we're but then it's like score because there's money there. People, it's awesome. <laughs> you know, and you get the vacuum out, you you discover or you investigate, you search and you find things. Well, here's what I want to post you today. Oftentimes, we sweep things under the rug, if you will. We put them in our closet, under our bed, because we really don't want to change our life. We want the blessings of God, but without the challenges and the change that needs to come. But when David prayed this, and this is what we're encouraging you to pray, is to say, God, search me. Move things around. Clean out the junk. Investigate my life. And he goes on with this, and he says, and know my heart. He's saying, know me. That is, I want you to know everything about me. You already created me, but God, I want you to show me things I don't even know about myself. I want you to examine me and tell me things I don't even know about myself. I want to realign. Maybe I'm right here, but I just need to adjust just a few degrees. Then he goes on and he says, test me and know my anxious thoughts. Have you ever heard of a stress test? Some of you may have had them done in your life. My mom's had to go in a couple different times and have a stress test done. And they basically go in and they're, they're trying to put you under machines and put you on a treadmill and do all this, this stuff to see what happens to your heart under stress. This is the exact same thing. When you see this phrase, test me, what you're literally saying is, God, try me, put me to the test. Put me through a little bit of stress. You go into the book of James and it uses the same phrase, only at that point it's talking about trials. 
Now, it seems very crazy that we would say, God, I invite trials into my life. And it's not that I'm asking you to pray that. But when you say, test me, what you're literally saying is, God, when my well breaks and my car breaks, my family gets ill, things aren't going the way that I want them to go, God, I'm still willing to sit in the chair and have faith and believe that you're sovereign and that you're in control and that everything's going to work out for your glory. It's willing to say, God, test me. Because here's the thing. When we're being tested, what we're doing is we're looking for weakness. God needs strong believers. He needs people who are all in. He needs people who are willing to please him with every facet of their life. And he says, David says to him, God, I long to be just like you. I long for you so much that I'm willing for you to put me to the test. You were made for God and by God for his pleasure and for his purpose. And until you realize that, until you give in and submit to that, your life is never going to make sense. It's never going to come together. You're always going to be asking the question, why? Why is nothing coming together? Why am I so incomplete? Why am I so unfulfilled? Until you realize that you've been crafted by design for his purpose and his pleasure, it's not going to make sense. You can continue to go against the grain. And I want to tell you, stop. Stop being stubborn. God loves you, but the more you get off track, the more he's going to get your attention by just making you miserable enough that you realize you can have all the money in the world. You can have all all the things that your friends look at you and they're like, man, I want what they have. But deep down inside, you're miserable. God's going to continue to make you miserable until you get back on track and you realize this life is not about me. This life is about me pleasing the one who made me. And when you get into that groove, life begins to make sense sense. So after God has performed, your great physician has performed this spiritual EKG and you're sitting on the edge of the bed and he says, look, I've performed this test and here's the things that have been revealed. Here's what's wrong with your heart. I want to know this morning, are you willing to eagerly and openly receive whatever God has to say to you regarding your life. Would you be one of those that says, you know, uh, God, I, I know that I, I haven't been doing everything that I need to do to have a healthy heart. But today, I am telling you that I'm ready to listen and I'm, relling, I'm, I'm ready and I'm willing to do things differently which I know will produce different results. I'm ready for you to lead me. The rest of that verse in verse 24 says that you would lead me in the way of everlasting. I am ready to follow your lead. I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to, to, to listen to your instructions. I'm ready to take your instructions and to follow Follow your lead, God. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, whoever you want me to be, I am willing because I don't want to have a heart condition. I want to please you. God's speaking to your heart right now. Can you hear him? Can you hear your doctor saying, hey, I've got a plan. Are, are we done playing games over here? Are you ready to, are you ready to do this? Because I have so many great things planned for you. I want to use you in ways that are just going to blow your mind. You won't even believe what I want to do with you. It's going to bring me pleasure, but I need you to Get in sync. Do you have a heart condition this morning? Stand up with me, if you would. Who of you in this place would be bold enough, courageous enough to say, all right, it's time to do this. I'm not talking about salvation. You you may have served God for 50 years. I'm talking about any part of your heart where God would say, hey, I want you to do something that you've never done before. I want to stretch you. I want to challenge you. And I want you to be willing and obedient to do whatever I ask you to do. How many of us in this room would be bold enough and courageous enough to say, 
All right, God. Anything you want me to do, anywhere you want me to go, whoever you want me to be, I want to please you. Would you raise your hand this morning? You say, I want to please God. I want to please God. Anybody in this room, anybody else, you say, I want to please. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about your life. You say, I want to please God in my life. I want to pray with you. Thank you for being honest. Thank you. And my hand is raised too because there will always be areas of our life where we can make it better. But we have to first be willing to listen and furthermore willing to obey. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would bless us on this path of bringing pleasure to you on this path of obedience, on this path of saying, God, I realize, Lord, that there's a condition with my heart and I want to make it right. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be who you've called me to be. I want to please you in every way imaginable. And I'm willing, God, to ask the question, search me. I'm opening myself up to you this morning, God. Can you pray that prayer with me? Search me. Open up my heart and look within and tell me, If there's anything inside of me that is offensive to you, tell me if there's any way that I've been disobedient to you, God. And then let's have a talk about the things that you found. And as you reveal, as you expose these potential diseases in my life, God, I pray right now that you would see the willingness of my heart to want to make it right and to please you in everything that I say to it. With your head bowed and your eyes still closed, I just want to ask you today to just examine yourself for just a moment and answer this question. Do I have a real relationship with Jesus? Not just head knowledge, not just I hope I'm right with God, but do you have a real relationship that's active and living every day? Do you hear God speak to you? Do you open the Word of God and read it and understand it and apply it to your life? Do you do you long to please God? The first step in having a heart monitor on your life is first just saying, God, I want a real relationship with you. I realize that you created me and you have a purpose for my life and I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I really want my life to change. I want to have purpose. I want to be happy. I want to be blessed. I want to know that heaven is my home. If that's you today and you would say, I know God, but I don't have a real relationship with God, but I want to. With eyes closed this morning, I just am going to ask on the count of three that you just raise your hand just as a sign to God and to your pastor so we know who we're praying for today, that you're saying yes to Jesus. I want a real relationship. On the count of three, just raise your hand. One, two, three three. Who are you this morning? Amen. I see your hands. Amen. Best decision you will ever make in your life is this decision. Church, will you pray together with me? Father God. Father God. I believe that you sent Jesus. I believe that you sent Jesus. And he gave his life. And he gave his life. To cover my sins. To cover my sins. I ask today. I ask today. That you would come into my heart. That you would come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I want to have a real relationship with you. I want to have a real relationship with I you. I give you permission. I give you permission. To change my life. To change my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Will you put your hands together and give them a hand, those who just made that decision. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.